So we're going to be discussing period three, which I like to call the warring period because it's literally just all wars. Washington's war, the Seven Years War, um, br the British War, the Revolutionary War, and the political war, the division of factions into Federalists and Jeffersonian Republicans um, due to the debates between the two political parties. And so we'll start off with the Seven Years War, which started in 1754 and ended in 1763, therefore lasting nine years, yet it's called the Seven Years War. Uh, don't worry about that. So the Seven Years War was fought over the Ohio River Valley, which both the British and the French uh, had claims to. And so they fought over that territory and um, the British won. Um, and so, um, so an imp a key event within the Seven Years' War that you need to know is the, um, the, uh, the, the Albany Plan of Union, which was set up by the colonists. It failed, but it did um, show the union and the unity between uh, the colonies, which is um, an important theme within this time period. Um, so we have the... Um, the ending of the Seven Years' War, which um, was the Treaty of Paris of, of 1763, uh, and that ended the war. Uh, the Span uh, Spain got the claims to the Louisiana Territory. Eventually, they sold it back to the, uh, to the French, which was sold back to us in the Louisiana Purchase by Thomas Jefferson, but we'll get to that in the next period. Um, and so we have the end of the Seven Years' War, and now Britain is in massive debt. Huge debt, like absolutely massive debt. So they tax the colonies. Their first tax is the Sugar Act, which was more strict than the Molasses Act. In fact, it's the first act that was militarily enforced. Um, so this is the start of the end of salutary neglect, which was the practice of ignorance, which was the mutual ignorance of British par of laws passed by British Parliament by both the colonies and the um, the and Parliament. Basically, they ignored the fact that the colonists were ignoring their laws. But the tax that really got on uh, the nerves of the colonists was the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act was, uh, it was basically like, uh, so the revenue obtained from the Sugar Act was so sm small that they had to create a new act that um, taxed a lot. So the Stamp Act um, obliged colonists to purchase and use special stamped paper for newspapers, um, certified uh, customs document, um, various licenses, College diplomas, legal forms, um, buying land, making bill, um, making wills, um, playing cards, uh, dice, all that stuff was used, and um, violators faced prosecution um, without a jury, and it was an internal tax, unlike the Sugar Act, um, um, which was an um, an external tax. So an internal tax basically means it's. Inter it's taxed by the um, by a representative of the British government within the colonies, which was uh, new, and so this really marks the end of salutary neglect. And um, the Americans are lazy; they don't like to pay taxes, and this is a com again a common theme in this time period that the um, Americans hate taxes, um, especially the South, which you'll see in uh, later periods. Unlike the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act generated a political storm. The Stamp Act Congress was founded, which basically was set up to um, um, basically try to get um, British Parliament to repeal the Act, which they did, but then later they passed the Declaratory Act, which basically said any law we pass, um, any law we pass um, has to be obeyed and you do not have a choice in that matter. So along with the Declaratory Act, there was a Quartering Act um, with the Declaratory Act, and there was resistance to this Quartering Act in the form of the Boston Massacre of 1770. Um, so Crispus Attucks and a group of other people started throwing snowballs at the British soldiers who were stationed, um, um, that, who were stationed in Boston, and uh, they were like, they taunted them, saying, "Shoot, shoot, go ahead and shoot," and they shot. Um, so seven people died, including Crispus Attucks, who was black. That's all you need to know about him. He's important because he's black. You should know the three prime, uh, the three prime ministers of Britain at this time: William Pitt, Grenville, and Townshend. So William Pitt was like, um, the colonists don't need to pay for anything because you were in the Seven Years' War, so don't worry. Grenville was like, yeah, y'all better pay. Um, and then uh, Townshend was like, screw the colonies, you pay off. 
all that debt that we had and the British should not pay for any of it because it's all your fault, especially General George Washington's fault because he's the one who started the war, which is why I call it Washington's War because he's the one who went into the Ohio River Valley and took over a fort and was like, uh, and was like, sh should we just like kill them all? And basically his like, his um, assistant was like, should we just kill them all so that we don't have to worry about this? I'm like, nah, don't worry about it. It won't, it's not like it'll start a war or anything. And it did. Benjamin Franklin, who was the father of the Alignment, he was the one who um, proposed the Albany Plan and he protested the Stamp Act along with and the Stamp Act to Congress. And so the Townshend duties were next after the Declaratory Act and the Quartering Act. And the Townshend Acts were basically like, uh, it was basically like a Townshend's Revenue Act of 1767, um, which taxed glass, paint, lead. It basically tried to replace the Stamp Act. Of course, the colonists weren't fooled by this and they, um, they call it, um, so they forced Townshend to, uh, Townshend and the Parliament to repeal it. Um, John Dickinson wrote um, in seventeen uh, six in the late seventeen sixties the letters from uh, from a Pennsylvania farmer, uh, which emphasized that uh, no tax designed to produce revenue um, uh, would be considered constitutional unless the people's elected represent uh, elected representatives vote for it. Basically, they're saying no taxation without representation, as stated by. Um, uh, Patrick Henry later on, no, um, give me liberty or give me death is also what he said. Um, basically, no taxation without representation is basically saying that we want um, um, direct representation within Parliament so that we can have our own say in these taxes that you're giving us. And Parliament was like, no, we're thinking about you, which is also known as, um, which is also known as virtual representation, which is like, oh yeah, we're thinking about you, so don't worry. We represent every single um, person with uh, and all the persons within the British Empire, um, which was untrue. They only thought about the motherland, which was very untrue. Seriously, the Parliament only ever thought about the motherland and were and was very selfish about that. Um, so after the Boston Massacre, there were the Committees of Correspondence in 1772 to 1773, which represents the unity between the colonies. There was also a proclamation line of 1763, which basically said that um, even though we won this land after the Seven Years' War, you can't go into it because we don't want to deal with more problems with the natives. And so this was very upsetting to the colonists, and they thought that the British was like uh, the British were like impeding on their uh, their um, rights and got very upset. So there was the Tea Act in 1773, which basically tried to lower the price of British tea and forced uh, citizens to buy tea because the British West, in, uh, British West Tea Company um, was failing uh, and it was about to go bankrupt. It was a joint stock company, of course, um, and it was um, giving revenue to the British Parliament directly and they didn't want it to um, go bankrupt, so they passed this Tea Act. And um, a lot of merchants were very, uh, who, ha who owned tea, um, merchandise and breweries did not like this, such as Samuel Adams, who you know is um, a beer name, which is why he owned a brewery, Samuel Adams. Get it? Um, so he did not like having to compete with these with this cheap British tea, so he, ins um, he incited a ton of colonists within Boston and was like, let's dump this tea in this British harbor, in this um, Boston harbor. And then they dressed up as Native Americans, went onto that ship in the Boston harbor and dumped all that tea into the Boston harbor. Uh, this is known as the Boston Tea Party, which is not a, um, like it's not a representation of the desire for freedom. It's a representation of America's greed and not wanting to actually pay for tea and not wanting to compete with cheap British tea. And so the reaction to this was the suspension of the Massachusetts Bay Charter, um, which basically and then forced it to become a royal colony. So after it became a royal colony, it was directly controlled by a governor who was appointed by the king, which was very upsetting to other colonies in the United States. And also they passed the Coercive Acts, otherwise known as the Intolerable Acts of 1774. And in 1770, so these acts included the uh, Quebec Act, the, um, the Massachusetts Bay Suspension Act, of course, that was one of them. Um, so that was the Boston Port Bill, which suspended the, bo um, which closed the Boston Port, uh, revoked the Massachusetts Charter, like I said before, forced it to become a royal colony, and there was the Quebec Act. 
um, which basically allowed um, parts of Quebec to expand into that new territory that was um, gained after the Seven Years' War, and this really upset people um, who had fought in the Seven Years' War and wanted to obtain that um, territory for themselves, and goddamn Canada had to get it from them instead. In America, we all hate Canada. No offense, Canada, but we hate you. Um, which you'll find out later in the War of 1812. We really want to conquer you, but we can't because we suck militarily. Um, so, then we also have the um, new quartering act. Uh, the last quartering act was suspended, but this new quartering act was incredible. The, um, basically, it said that it went far beyond the previous act in 1765, and it um, was a proof of military um, tyranny. Basically, it allowed um, murderers, uh, British soldiers who like murdered people to get off scot free. They could come in whenever they wanted. They could force you to give them bed, sh um, give them a bed, give them shelter, give them food, and they'd have to. Pay. And the colonists would have to, um, who were, um, who's who had the house, had to pay for all of the um, soldiers' needs and desires, um, without without argument, or they could be killed. And then and then the British soldier could be wouldn't be prosecuted because of the quartering act and this really really upsets um and these acts really upset the colonists and so they create the first continental congress which was a response to the uh, intolerable acts and they create the suffolk the suffolk resolves that um, recently had placed massachusetts in a state of persis uh, persistent rebellion right and so we have the uh, resistance and um, the resolves declared that the colonies um, owed no obedience to these coercive acts whatsoever. So the Suffolk uh, Resolves basically said, we don't want to listen to you. Basically, it's a counter-argument to the Declaratory Act, which said, you need to follow our laws with, um, with total obligation. And so this is the brink of revolution. And so the war starts with the Battle of Lexington and Concord in 1775. Which was, um, so Lexington was a loss for um, um, American troops, but Concord was in fact a victory. It was the first battle and it was a victory, which is nice. And so let's get into the turning points of 1776. The entire year is a huge turning point because you have the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and Valley Forge. So the Declaration of Independence and um, Thomas Paine's Common Sense were both um, morale boosters. Thomas Paine's Common Sense basically opened up, basically said that it's common sense to break away from the British Empire because empire and monarchy is bad and stupid and outdated. And the Declaration of Independence was like this huge breakup letter to Britain, basically listing all of the grievances and the reasons for separation from the motherland. And the Valley, and the battle, uh, it's not really a battle, but Valley Forge was a sneak attack on the Hessians, which were mercenaries um, that were very, very influential in the war. They killed tons of militia soldiers, and basically, the Hessian, what, if the Hessians um, were there, the, um, the American troops were going to laws, and so Gen um, General George Washington um, led troops across the Delaware River um, to, the Hess to the Hessian camp um, during the middle of the night when they were sleeping, um, and then rounded all, all 900 of them up and arrested all of them. And so this was a huge turning point in the war because the Hessians were now gone. The Hessians were from Germany. They were German missionaries. Um, and so there were also loyalists and um, there were loyalists. So the loyalists were um, colonists who who wanted to, uh, who supported Britain in the war. And there were a lot of loyalists. Like um, patriots only took, were only like, um, forty percent of the entire colon of the entire colonies, like they were really outnumbered by the number of loyalists. In fact, most of the South was were loyalists because they wanted to continue trading with Britain and their cash crops because of the mercantilist um, ideals that were um, in station that were um, instated before Washington. Uh, so Valley Forge was a um, huge victory, and it really shows the um, the great mind of George Washington as a military strategist. Actually, wait, that wasn't Valley Forge, that was Trenton, and, or otherwise known as the Battle of Delaware, so my bad. Uh, Valley Forge was just a morale boost one. It was, uh, that, it was not a battle, it was just people were dying of smallpox, and they needed to be, um, 
they were the army was about to be disbanded, but George Washington was like a, a national uh, motivational speaker, and von Steuben trained a militia there. So it wasn't a battle that was different. So the battle was actually Trenton. So that was when it, they captured the Hessians. Um, that was the turning point, was um, the Battle of Trenton, and that's when they captured the Hessians. It was on Christmas Eve. And so that was the first victory for the Continental Army, like the first actual victory. Lexington and Concord was not actually a victory. They just killed more British soldiers. I mean, they lost, like, they just killed more British soldiers than were able to be killed, than the um, American soldiers were able to kill. But again, it was still a loss. There were tons of lost lives in that battle. Trenton really shows the brilliance of George Washington, as I said before. But last time I said Valley Forge, which was wrong. Um, and so you also have the Battle of Saratoga, which was an incredible turning point for the war because um, it allowed the French to join the war and support the Americans because the Americans needed this support from France. And France was like, we will only support you once we, once we know that you are, um, you are capable of doing of a victory in this war so that we can help you, right? And so that's when they send von Steuben to help train the troops and then that leads to Valley Forge, which is not a battle again, it's not a battle. And then there was also Lafayette who joined after the Battle of Saratoga as well and he had control of the Navy and that French Navy is what leads to the Battle of Yorktown, which is the final battle of the Revolutionary War. And basically they surround Cornwallis in Yorktown, it's a peninsula, and it's um, basically they surround it on every side, um, and so the French Navy on the water and the militia and the um, the American militia um, on land, and they just completely just um, force Cornwallis to surrender, and they won. And after that surrender, um, King George III realized that it was a fruitless effort to continue fighting against such um, an incredible na an incredible group of states that had such a huge cause against the motherland. And so the Treaty of Paris of 1783, again, Treaty of Paris, which is funny because lots of Treaty of Paris's. So this treaty basically forces all British soldiers to leave. Of course they don't. It forces Brit uh, Britain to recognize American sovereignty, which they don't. And it allows America to become their own nation, which it does, so that's good. And so now let's talk about American governance, but for and now let's talk about American governance during this time period. So the first um, form of American government um, was the Articles of Confederation, which was a huge failure. It gave more power to the states than the federal government, and each state started creating their own currency values, um, and the debt increased dramatically within the states because there was no one to actually like collect the federal debt, um, and so Shays Rebellion really showed off the um, the failure of this because. No one was able to stop the insurrection um, from occurring. After Shays' Rebellion, um, the Founding Fathers realized that they made a terrible mistake with the Articles of Confederation, so they create the U.S. Constitution, which a lot of people contribute um, that to James Madison for creating. But the U.S. Constitution was a much better form of governance. It had, it originally did not have the Bill of Rights. That was added as a compromise with the Anti-Federalists, and the U.S. Constitution was basically formed around compromises. So there was a two uh, bicameral legislature, two house legislature with the Senate and the House of Representatives. The Senate being um, each person has, each state has two members in the Senate. So that's part of the New Jersey plan. Um, and then there was also the, um, the, the House of Representatives, which was Virginia plan. It represented the population of the states. And so this was a great compromise. Um, like the Connecticut Compromise, um, to put the states together. Um, it basically allowed all these states, and there was also, um, it allowed them the, the states to have equal representation with them, within Congress, uh, by both population and by equal opportunity. And so there was also the Three-Fifths Compromise, which was a compromise with the southern states so that they could consider their slaves three-fifths, so that each that out of five slaves, three of them are considered part of the population. And so they did this so that they would have more representation within Congress um, through the House of Representatives because they would have a greater population and they wanted this. And so this was a compromise. And so um, slavery was, uh, was talked about in the US Constitution. It was considered legal by the US Constitution, um, which is why the 13th Amendment had to be passed later on. Um, so there was a few 
problems with this and the anti so there were so there were two groups of people the federalists who supported the the ratification and the anti-federalists who did not the anti-federalists wanted to protect the individual liberties of the citizens they thought that the um, u.s constitution was too, was giving too much power to the federal government and they would encroach on the liberties and the um, freedoms and rights of the of the people and so the bill of rights was the compromise between these uh, between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, and it was ratified in 1788. And then George Washington, along uh, with the U.S. with the pass with the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, became president in 1789 until 1796. He was president, or was it 1790? Yeah, 1796. He was president, um, and so he served two terms, and he set all the precedents for the president that's you don't need to know the specific precedents you just need to know that he set the precedent for the position of the president of the president like he set up he wanted to be called mr president instead of like king washington which is what people called him he was like sir or king washington or lord washington he was just like just call me mr president like president of a club right like just mr president is fine he wanted to be um, modest about it because he didn't want it to be like a, mon a monarchical position um, a lot of people wanted him to be king and be like a monarchical um, ruler, but he did not want to set that precedent. And so during his farewell address, he addressed the issue of foreign affairs and and um, political parties. And so this is, play, is very important. You might need to write an essay about this. Uh, Washington's farewell address, he basically said, um, Ada, he was like, Hamilton, Jefferson, please don't fight anymore. I know you have two different ideas for how the um, government should work and how ec and the economic systems and um, whether to support the French Revolution or not, but I'm telling you, please stay out of foreign affairs and please do not form so many and please do not form political parties that will only lead us to destruction. Guess what? He was right and guess what? We didn't listen to him. Um, so... Let's get into this political war between Hamilton and Jefferson. So Hamilton wanted a big government, and his party was the Federalist Party. They wanted big government. They want so Hamilton really wanted like a monarchy. He wanted to um, have the federal government have like extreme control over the state governments. And in fact, he didn't really like the state governments that much. And his economic plan included a Bank of the United States, a bank charter, which was accepted by George Washington. And after that happened, Jefferson left um, Washington's cabinet. He resigned and in, then ran for president against Adams in 1796, but he lost and he became his vice president in 1797. And so with that, we have the ending of Washington's presidency. Adams becomes president. Um, we have Hamilton versus Jefferson. So Hamilton wanted um, that big government. Jefferson wanted to represent the human farmers, the middle class farmers in the South. Or he wanted an agrarian society where everyone had their own farm and was able to be self-serving. He hated foreign affairs. He didn't want to deal with commerce. He thought that America should be America. Uh, he thought America should only be strictly American and no imports, no exports. We should only rely on ourselves and just like these yeoman farmers who support themselves. And so this is nice, and his party was called the Republican Party. Of course, his idea was never realized, otherwise we'd have, you know, an agrarian society now, which we don't, we have an industrial society. Hamilton actually supported industry, so therefore Hamilton was actually, a, was actually an influential um, part of the industry. Um, part of today and Washington actually listened more to Hamilton when it came to economics than when it came to um, Jefferson and so um, The Bank of the United States was created the Treasury was created um, Hamilton became um, leader of the Treasury um, head of the bank um, And then he was shot bang bang by Aaron Burr in 1802 Aaron Burr was uh, Thomas Jefferson's vice president So that's just way to rub it in right there Aaron Burr was also is running against him as um, governor in like New York, I'm pretty sure. I th um, I'm pretty sure. Um, so Adams' presidency has the X Y Z affair. That's really important, um, and the Alien Sedition Act. So the X Y Z affair um, had to do with the um, the French kept on impressing American ships in their fight against British uh, against Britain, and Britain did the same thing, but only a little bit later. And so um, Adams sent three uh, diplomats to France. Um, but the, um, and so the French diplomats X, Y, and Z, they won't be named so that they couldn't get power over them, so that they, so that America could get power over them after what they did. They basically said, pay us. If, we'll stop if you give us money. And we said, we would, ra and we said, um, that we would rather, um, we would rather pay millions for defense 
but not one cent for tribute. And that's what um, one of the diplomats said to the uh, French diplomats. And so yeah, there was a quasi war, which was very popular. And um, later there was also the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 that Adams passed. Basically, it said that the president that the president had the power to to expel any foreigner, and there was also the Naturalization Act, and it must be a U.S. Um, resident for 14 years to gain citizenship to vote. And the Sedition Act basically said criticism of the government is illegal, which would suck today because everyone would be put in jail. Um, so the Kentucky, the Virginia Kentucky Resolves, uh, created by Jefferson and Madison, basically. Um, nullified this war, and this is basically the first time states have ever nullified a federal law. Um, and so this uh, sets a precedent for nullification. Uh, it's repealed by Jefferson and during his term. And so we end this period with the election of 1800. Je uh, Jefferson wins. It's an all-out brawl. But it's a, like a mud-slinging fight between Jefferson and Adams. Jefferson wins. Adams calmly hands over his seat after quickly putting on new Supreme Court justices, um, which leads to problems in the future, which we'll talk about under um, Marshall's Supreme Court um, in period four. But just know that Adams uh, leaving peacefully set to precedent for the peaceful um, passing of power between presidents.